Good evening and uh, welcome. I'm uh, here to talk about uh, technical debts and digital assets. It's uh, something that uh, has been on my mind for a little while. I've been thinking about technical debt and um, it basically seems to be a uh, quick framework to discuss uh, some aspects of development and uh, I think that um, it might be more than that. So uh, just to begin, I'm pretty sure everyone here has a good idea of what technical debt is. Um, it uh, was essentially created by Ward Cunningham, developer of the first wiki, WikiWikiWeb. And basically, if you are shipping first time code, it's like going into debt. Basically, you've got something that uh, you've created that could be better, but it's fast and it works. And uh, his observation was that uh, a little debt will speed things along as long as you pay it off quickly. And um, basically, if you uh, look at uh, some of the uh, online uh, sources discu uh, discussing technical debt, uh, for example, it uh, on Hacker Noon uh, is broken out into three different areas, um, the same uh, Division happens in Fowler's technical debt uh, quadrants. Uh, so you have a deliberate versus uh, inadvertent, and uh, that's uh, set against a reckless versus prudent approach. Um, essentially, it's a way of classifying what happens to your code uh, if you uh, are under pressure and aren't uh, optimizing for the long run. Uh, and uh, basically, if you look at technical debt, uh, it looks at your code. It's focused on the technology. Um, it assumes a multipath solution so that uh, you can do it fast, or you can do it good, or you, there's a variety of other paths to create software. Um, and anyone who's worked in an organization knows that most of them get followed, not necessarily the best one. Um, it focuses on should versus is. And it's transactional, so that there will be certain areas of the code that you'll be able to identify as a particular element in a particular technical debt, and then uh, take that up with your management or others who are developing on the code base to discuss what should be done. Um, then it's also framed as personal debt. So uh, the developer is uh, encouraged to take personal uh, responsibility for the quality of the code. Um, this is something that if you're creating code, one does almost naturally. But it's a, a, an idea of personal debt. So, um, and also, uh, in conversation amongst developers, it uh, acts as a social currency. So um, it, it's not unusual for developers to discuss various uh, technical debts in a code base that uh, uh, they're all working on. Um, I was thinking about that, and uh, it occurred to me uh, that that is so retail, uh, very much leaf node at the outside of uh, how you would think about debt. Uh, it's understandable because most developers have uh, a technology basis. Uh, they aren't familiar with uh, corporate finance. Uh, the structures of uh, uh, national debt, uh, the corporate bond market, um, things like that are frameworks that may not, um, well, they are outside their scope of knowledge. So um, instead of looking at the technical difficulties of a particular part of code, I'd like you to think about something a little differently. Um, to begin with, think about software or systems as intangible assets. So this would be uh, an asset that you would create. It's not physical. It's uh, very much a, um, uh, well, uh, an intangible. It uh, is a system that's running on something physical, but it's the creation is not uh, represented by a physical object. Um, there are a variety of intangible assets. So your reputation uh, with your FICO score 
is an intangible asset. The social network that we're here this evening uh, is also a social asset that many of us enjoy. And so there are a variety of social assets that can be recognized as distinct and different from physical assets and financial assets. Um, so I'd also ask, in the vein of a technical debt, to think of debt capacity as an intangible asset. So if you needed to borrow money, all of you have a certain credit limit that you can do. That is an asset. If you are an organization and you have um, relationships with banks, they also give you a credit limit. They'll make it very well known to uh, your finance department that if you need to finance uh, accounts receivable or some other asset, uh, that is available to you. So that also is an intangible asset. And that is a, a type of asset that has existed since at least the 6th century BC when the first storied uh, of a commercial, of a, a financial product was a Greek philosopher who was uh, challenged to become wealthy and cornered the olive press market ahead of what became a large uh, harvest, uh, indicating the first um, uh, uh, derivatives deal. So basically, um, this has been going on for a long time. Um, the, uh, in Babylon, the cuneiform tablets are basically all futures contracts for agriculture. Um, but in the West, financial contracts, corporate debt, has at least a couple hundred years of experience. And uh, in terms of intangible assets, corporate finance is the older asset. It's had a longer term to evolve, and it's become much more sophisticated. So rather than looking at just what a technical debt from a credit card perspective might be able to contribute to our understanding of software and systems, um, I'd like to think about what some of the models and elements that are from the corporate finance world uh, and how they might be able to uh, inform us on these kinds of, uh, uh, well, be able to inform us on how information systems, software, uh, can be uh, managed. Um, so basically, I'm asking you to take the technical debt concept and run with it a little bit. Um, basically, the ba this is going to be about paying attention. It is about paying interest because the semantic collision that one finds in the financial world and your attention span isn't accidental. When you are uh, loaning money out and you are paying interest, the reason you're doing that is so that the people who are um, selling you that debt, you're going to pay attention to them. You're going to answer their calls. Um, this becomes even more important in the attention economy. So if you think about uh, intangible assets, they only exist because someone is paying attention to them. Someone, is pay someone has an interest. They're paying interest. And that is the model that I'd like to take this to uh, from simply running a uh, uh, technical debt as an identification of where code work needs to be done to perhaps understanding that if you've got software or a system, that if no one is paying attention to it, it's not going to exist very long. And that's where I might. So um, the basis of this is the physical assets versus intangible assets. And this is essentially the space alien test. If uh, humanity disappears from the planet, space aliens show up 
and they go to the patent office, they're going to walk through and go, oh yeah, we've got that. That works. We understand how that works. We understand this. This is an odd way to do that. They're going to understand the functionality of that kind of um, uh, gift that our, give, our government provides to innovators. If they were to go to the copyright office, and if it's in the same tradition as most of the um, uh, historians and, and anthropologists, they'll probably look at it and go, well, these are all religious documents, um, which is an unusual uh, way to go. The idea is that physical assets and intangible assets are very different. Physical assets persist, they're indivis indivisible. The uh, relationship that humanity has with them is based on possession. Um, double entry accounting, our fundamental financial tool, is a good model for that. Interest or intangible assets is a call on your future attention span. So when you have an interest in something like plug, the idea is that second Thursday of the month, your attention span has been spent that evening here. And the odds are that it will continue. The model of double entry accounting of that is very poorly fitted. Uh, network effects is a much better model. Um, so uh, basically the, the idea is that technical debt versus digital assets is that the debt is undertaken for systems and software, not just a particular focused area of improvable code. It's for the whole system, the whole software, not just the to-dos. So there's a little bit of difference in terms of scope. Why you would think, why you should think this way? So I'm going to advocate for it. Um, because if you look at a uh, debt, technical debt, um, as a um, argumenting point, it is uh, something that it puts you in uh, discussion in terms of this versus that. It's a point of argument. Whereas if you're looking at a, tang uh, a, um, a digital asset, the idea is that you're coming together and it's going to be a place of agreement because you're looking at how the whole system is going to work and how everybody understands and contributes understanding to that system. Um, that's the first point. So there's a change in perspective. Uh, the second one is that this, the descriptive scope I just mentioned, the um, uh, uh, digital asset is aimed at the whole system. It's holistic, whereas the uh, uh, technical debt is at a specific problem. It's got limited scope and it doesn't scale very well. Um, also, uh, if you uh, look at digital assets in terms of uh, debt and uh, I will get into this further, um, you'll have the ability to prioritize effort. You'll be, have the ability to schedule your deployment of attention. And you'll also be able to link capabilities to your budget. So it's got a much greater organizational um, touch than, say, just technical debt. That is the uh, hope and the reasons why you might want to think this way. Um, so in order to get into that, I'm going to very quickly go through some of the elements of uh, financial instruments like a bond. Um, it's basically a contract. There's an issuer and a lender and a trustee. The issuer is borrowing. The lender is providing the cash. And the trustee is making sure that certain rules are found, uh, followed. So that, uh, for example, if uh, the covenants are violated, the uh, issuer has to give money back to the lender or in the f coming uh, slides, uh, more informational aspects. Um, in order to put together a bond or a bond issuance, there typically is a, a syndicate of uh, people who are putting together and selling the particular bond, so they're placing 
the uh, uh, financial instrument. It's a very social aspect where uh, they get together and make sure that um, the uh, issuer is successful in fully funding their uh, loan. Uh, then there are underwriters who take that and they are also part of the distribution system. And uh, finally, a bond exists within uh, a term structure. And basically, if you have more than one bond, you have a term structure. It's over time what kind of borrowing you have made. So governments will have 30 years uh, out um, when a government becomes unstable, uh, such as uh, Argentina did a couple years ago, uh, the term structure collapses. So you can't get a 30-year bond or a 10-year bond or a five-year bond on the market. You are very short-term funding. So that is some of the basic structures of a bond. Um, each debt has a price or face value. This is the amount that's being borrowed. The date of maturity is when the money is going to be paid back to the investor. Coupons are what maintain your interest in this financial transaction, literally, because those are uh, either uh, six months or annual payments. There are uh, interests for maintaining the bond. Um, the bond is, as I said, uh, combined with uh, rules and regulations, covenants, and also can be divided into what are called tranches. And uh, these are basically segmenting the debt offering. And I'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, then there's the phases of the commercial debt offering. So if you're going to be offering debt or you're going, going to be buying debt, first you do, you do due diligence. If you're offering or issuing debt, you do origination. You make coupon payments, you return capital at the end of the term, and if you're lucky, you don't have to do any cash calls, which means a cash call happens when you made a mistake or life intervened, and those who have an investment in your debt want to maintain their position, and in order to do that, they have to give you more money. So when things go south and the people want to maintain the relationship with your financial instrument, you can make a cash call. Real estate people in the valley here will understand that concept all too well. Um, so there were lots of moving pieces there. And I'd like to very quickly go through uh, them. And uh, as I do, I'm going to be reframing them in terms of intangible assets. And uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, you can ask at the end, too. but. Uh, It'll probably work a lot better um, as I'm going through them. Uh, so the contract, uh, this is where you decide what you're going to build in terms of a digital asset, how much you need in terms of attention in order to do that. So for example, uh, let's talk about uh, putting together a website with a fully qualified domain name uh, content in a web server and a database, something simple. Um, the issuer is the person who is interested in doing the project and trying to coordinate the human capital and interest needed to accomplish that. So that's going to be you or your organization. And it's based on your planning uh, for the digital asset that you want to create and what you need to keep it up and running. So um, for example, if you're doing uh, synthetic monitoring of a website, you have to have interest in keeping track of the results from that monitoring even after you've set it up and um, paid either open source or free you know, commercial software to do it. Um, but this is going to uh, determine the debt project that you're going to be uh, funding your digital asset with. Um, then there's the in lender or investor. Um, this is you or your future you, and it is uh, a little bit different from the typical uh, investor because it's an obligation you've taken on as a participant to pay attention to something. So, for example, you're here uh, second Thursday of the month. Um, that's a fairly uh, significant investment in your time, 
and uh, going forward, uh, it's a way of talking about obligations. Now, uh, this works whether you're working with commercial software systems, uh, whether you're participating in a, an Apache project, your time and uh, your investment of attention into a particular digital asset is the role that the lender or investor uh, plays. And then there's the trustee. So if you have a third party that is uh, going to umpire the covenants, uh, uh, whether that is uh, because you're getting a degree from a college or you're getting a license or it's an open source project uh, managed by the Apache uh, Foundation, these are third parties that set rules and maintain compliance. Um, and this is the role that the trustee plays in a regular debt obligation. Uh, it's the same role that would be played in a digital asset uh, funded by, uh, well, not funded, but framed in terms of uh, uh, a debt structure. So uh, an attention debt, if you will. Um, then there's the syndicate and the underwriters. Um, are you working with others, part of a larger group? Um, so if you're uh, in the, uh, the Apache Foundation, say you're working with a big top uh, uh, project, um, you're not alone. There are others who are supporting that. There are others who are doing the distribution and bringing in other investors and others who are paying attention to the project. Um, they perform the same role as syndicate or underwriters. Um, again, it's a corralling of a attention, a uh, corralling of skills. So if they're um, be able to bring developers into Hadoop or something along those lines, they are coordinating a uh, investor that is contributing attention, skills, development to that project, and they are working within a syndicate um, or uh, as a role as an underwriter. Um, for example, um, uh, IBM and other Red Hat, for example, also uh, does a great deal of underwriting of open source projects. They take the responsibility to supply the skill, the attention to get something up and running, and then they turn around and say, it's here, it works, please use it. And at that point, they're distributing attention. Uh, they're gathering a much larger investor pool into a particular project after having supported it, uh, usually in terms of a syndicate with other large institutions. Um, again, term structure, this is basically if you have multiple debts, if you have a portfolio, uh, this is how you look at the attention you have to give. So if you attend a variety of meetings, then this is your term structure because you only have a certain amount of time to pay attention. So um, if you have one uh, debt that you've issued, uh, then that is just one thing that you're looking at. You're looking at uh, how frequently do you have to pay attention to it. Um, this is where you can look at it from an organizational perspective and identify whether you have enough skills, enough people to actually support the kind of digital assets you're trying to create based on a model of debt. So there's also price or face value. So when you uh, initiate a debt, it's got a price that you're selling it for. You're saying you need to invest this amount of, it, of intention to understand how this works. This often <coughs> can be thought of as the learning curve or the S curve that you'll be climbing to understand how something works. So if you are working with a very complicated commercial piece of software, not only do you have to buy the software for money, you also have to spend time and probably money learning how to use it. That's the face value of the debt that you took on when you decided to 
have that as a digital asset. Date of maturity, that's the other end. So you've started, you've invested, you've created a digital asset. The digital asset has grown, become valuable, increased in value, created um, a digi uh, important uh, information for you. And at the end, what do you do? Usually at the date of maturity, that is when you're transitioning to a new or different digital asset. But it's not unusual for a bond or something to hit the date of maturity and have been uh, interest only. So uh, the date of maturity is when you have decided that the digital asset you're looking at is no longer providing the kind of performance that you want. Maybe you have a better alternative in the pipeline. While the digital asset is functioning, you have to pay attention to it. Not all the time. Sometimes, uh, for example, if you are just doing, um, say, uh, monitoring on a website, uh, you set up uh, the monitoring software and you review it in, in the morning and in the evening and if there's an alarm. You've decided when you took on this digital asset to essentially pay these coupons of attention. Um, financial coupons are typically uh, given back as money to the investor. This model, they're different because they are a call on your attention span. So as the person who has decided to invest in a particular digital asset, these coupons are how you plan going forward what kind of capacity you need to support it. So if um, you need uh, a Java programmer and uh, uh, somebody who can field alarms and uh, knows the system 24-7, that means you've got a couple Java programmers and you've probably got a couple locations throughout the planet where they can watch it during their daytime. But it's a way of identifying how much of a commitment uh, your digital asset is calling for you, from you, because your commitment is your time. Uh, again, covenants, this is just not just boilerplate. Um, the impression might be that uh, covenants on loans are uh, just legalese, they're standard, they never change. That's not true. Uh, they do change, they're very reactive to how the, the debt market is at a particular time that an offering occurs. Um, we've seen what happens when the market gets overheated and the covenants are trimmed back and you get no doc loans. So these are the rules. They typically don't go way out of whack, but they do change, they are reactive, and it's typically the responsibility of a third party to make sure that the rules are followed. Um, so uh, otherwise you end up in court. Um, then tranches. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect. It is uh, French for slice. And basically when you create a digital asset and uh, undertake the, the intangible debt uh, for that, you can identify different parts of the debt. In the financial world, the debt might be segmented according to risk levels or um, uh, time frames. Um, but for example, in our example, uh, the amount of attention needed to maintain a fully qualified dona domain name or understanding the functions of a database or the interest needed to run a content on a web server on a VPS are all different tranches of this intangible debt. So the project can, con can contain sub-projects. So that when you've identified a digital asset that is what you intend to utilize, you can look at all of the various parts of it and these can all have different uh, coupons, if you will. So, uh, and, and then other aspects of uh, uh, the debt overall. But that would all be part of when you issued the debt, this would be included in it. Um, now we're starting to get into the various uh, fa um, phases of debt. 
First one being due diligence, which is basically pay attention and know what you're talking about. Or don't get surprised. Try and avoid surprises. Um, when making plans in both the intangible world and the tangible world, uh, surprise is uh, never very good. And so the more due diligence you do, the least likely you are to be surprised by something, by a plan that doesn't work out, by, oh, we don't own that domain name or some other aspect. It's basically just be prepared. And it is, of course, um, something of a legal requirement, too. So uh, there are plenty of uh, how-tos on doing due diligence for uh, financial investments and other projects. And they are equally applicable to intangible assets. So um, also, good luck with that. Um, the next phase after having understood what you're trying to do is to originate the uh, debt, the intangible debt. And uh, this is where you pull it all together, you put it down, you have common ground with everyone who's going to be involved, and you basically put it together and then go get investors. Um, there is um, uh, an aspect of this that uh, is not uncommon uh, to the, the financial world is that putting this together is a significant task in and of itself. So typically the financing used to finance the creation of this kind of a, um, uh, effort is referred to as the bridge loan. And so uh, be aware that uh, you may need to go out and get a bridge loan in order to put your uh, intangible debt proposal together in order to realize a digital asset. Um, of course, next phase, once you have your uh, digital asset started in order to maintain interest by those who have supported you and are paying interest to you, are interested in you, is to maintain coupon payments. So this may be identifying that you need two out of every uh, five days of a Java programmer for the next 18 months for a project or something along those lines. So it gives you a time-based way to look at what kind of a requirement and skills you're going to need. And the analogy is coupons. It stretches it out into the, into the time dimension. Um, so you're um, basically uh, giving people the obligation to pay attention to your project. It's a bit of an inverted relationship that uh, financial debt, but uh, it uh, supports a good look at um, project planning. And then at the final end of it, uh, you're looking at something uh, along the lines of capital uh, return. Uh, this is very easy when you're dealing with a fungible asset like money. Uh, you just give some of it back. Uh, hopefully you've done that and um, made money uh, above and beyond the amount of debt that you have to pay off, pay off. But in the intangible asset, it's a transition because uh, you have to pay attention to get the value that you've created in your digital asset out of the digital asset that is ending because when you no longer pay interest to a, a digital asset, it ends and you have to move it to the next one. And this handles the egress. So basically the capital return at the end, the balloon payment or whatever it might be, um, if it's an Oracle product, it's probably a pretty big balloon payment. You have to basically pay attention to it in order to capture the value that your digital asset brought to you. And if you don't, it's lost. So there are plenty of projects that uh, wrap up shop and uh, declare a loss. But hopefully, yours won't be one of those. Um, if it is one, but it is still something that everyone agrees it's worth doing, the next phase is the cash call. This is basically getting an extension on your intangible debt. And it's an obligation that you have uh, made to those who have already invested the typical structure is you've already invested. Um, value has not been uh, removed yet. Uh, there isn't a payoff yet. Uh, and if you want to stay in the group, the syndicate, 
that is going to get a payoff, you have to add in more assets. Um, no one's happy when that happens, uh, unless, of course, it happens and then it returns to a big payoff. Um, but those are some of the uh, recharacterizations of basic uh, debt structures, phases, um, and the idea is that as a framework, this is more involved than just simply looking at something and looking at technical debt. So maybe it's a next step. Um, this might not be too familiar with, uh, uh, you may not have a great deal of familiarity with this. Uh, don't worry about that. Just kind of try and soak in some of the perspective that it's a larger framework. It's got more moving parts. It's a little bit bigger. Um, and uh, the takeaway that I would suggest is that rather than understanding this in terms of the money, it's understanding it in terms about of time in your attention span. So um, it's not only yours, but your organization's and your people's attention span. And um, the whole idea is that this is a framework that is going to help in uh, understanding the budgeting and the allocations that uh, intangible assets, uh, digital assets, are going to need um, to, uh, to be realized. And to some extent, this framework is meant to exist as an alternative to the financial side who is looking at the intangible assets with the double entry uh, model. And uh, while that has worked for physical assets, and um, corner cases such as money. Uh, it's not a very good way of capturing uh, what is needed for a digital asset or an intangible asset in general. Um, so uh, this works for expensive projects and free projects. If you are investing in uh, understanding the, the uh, HTTPD, uh, you don't have to spend money, but you are going to spend some time. Um, this speaks to resources needed. So if you need a Java programmer, if you need a, uh, a JavaScript or a Node.js programmer, you're going to need somebody who does deployments in that environment. So it, it uh, guides in uh, covering all of the skill bases that you're going to need to create a digital asset. The idea is basically people are, you get together and everybody contributes as much as they can to understanding what is needed to create the digital asset because that's how you get to the principle of least surprise and more likely to create a digital asset that fulfills your objectives. Um, also, skills are an upfront determination. You know going in what you're going to need. Um, you're going to know how much you need of it because that's the coupons. Um, and then um, if you were to look at this in terms of a uh, network structure, it focuses, it's, it takes into focus the internal nodes throughout the organization, not just the leaf nodes of the developer. Because technical debt, while it can be a good tagging or labeling approach, and it can be a good discussion point about how to develop software, it doesn't speak to the larger commitments that an organization needs to do. And it can also be part of a, a digital asset. So it can be included in uh, this kind of a framework. Um, and then, of course, uh, the whole basis is that there's no accounting for intangibles because double entry accounting, unless it is exception, has an immense amount of false work, does not capture the characteristics of intangible assets. And so that is an ongoing challenge right now. Um, probably one of the reasons productivity has apparently <coughs> ceased to uh, increase because it's all being uh, uh, happening in intangible assets. Um, and uh, so um, hopefully this will provide an interesting model for uh, you to look at caring for intangible assets going ahead. Um, if you have any financial background, um, uh, you might 
have wondered at the creation of the goodwill uh, uh, designation. And uh, this is essentially a tell that the accountants have given up and have not understood the value of what they're trying to measure. And so they lump it all into all other, or in this uh, case, the goodwill. Um, I know that was probably uh, a lot pretty quick and off topic for a lot of people. But um, if you have any questions, um, now would be a good time. OK. Um, thank you.